What's up, everyone? This is Mark, your president of Studio 346. <laughs> Jake, I don't think they're going to believe that. We, 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 I sound we, just we, like him. Who's, who's going to tell them? It's the them? microphone, Jake. Yes, so, however... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> blooper reel at the end? Blooper reel at the end. De- definitely blooper, blooper reel, reel at the yep. end. With blooper this many reel. people on call, please. So, uh, hello everyone on YouTube. Uh, this is Jake and Tom at Studio 346. You may notice that, unlike as previously said, we are not, in fact, Mark. Um, Mark isn't here. And in fact, a lot of the folks aren't here. Pretty much most of the software team is out this month. And they are getting some much needed R&R. And in the case of a couple of them, they had some life events happening. So, we are wishing them well from afar, hoping they're doing great. And we look forward to having them back next month. But for this month, we had basically the rest of the team holding down the fort and getting some work done. We do want to take a behind-the-scenes look at the pipeline for information and resources that make this game possible. Um, but before we get into that, congratulations to our project manager, Tristan, for getting married. And we'd like to wish Mark well in Croatia as he's visiting family. Let's all just take a moment to wish him Sreten Topla Chasha Mayonese, which is definitely how you just say have a nice vacation in Croatian and has nothing to do with a warm glass of mayonnaise. Just trust me on that one. Are you sure about that? 100%. Jake speaks the third best Croatian. It's fine. Alrighty. So moving along, uh, let's introduce the folks on our research team, uh, starting with Andrew. Hi there. My name is Andrew Brandon. I've been involved in uh, preservation for a long time and I've dabbled in railroad simulation games. Um, I currently serve as a curator of a railroad museum in California, and I'm a professional railroad consultant, kind of a paint nerd, a bit of an architecture nerd. Uh, I love 19th century things, and I love that uh, I get to have the best job where I get to nitpick things. Um, (laughs) I've also contributed artwork and paint reference material to the team. Um, I'm one of also probably, I'd say, the field researchers who likes to get out and and yeah. also, I founded a website called PacificNG.org, some of you may know of, that is a reference site for kind of all things 19th century railroading, but specifically narrow gauge. So I'm happy to be here working with uh, the wonderful team. Hey, so I'm uh, Josh Bernhard, uh, currently president of the Western Crossroads Railway Museum uh, in Utah, and I'm a historian specializing in cultural aspects of railroads. Apparently, I've been told I am the world leading expert on the American Railway Sandwich. Um, but with the game, I'm also a 2D artist and researcher focusing on lettering and the commodity labels. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Ross. I'm a very, very recent master's degree graduate. Um, I first took up graphic design about four years ago as a passion project. And I absolutely love working on this project and just, you know, further honing my skills. I'm definitely a paint nerd. Um, I will talk anybody's ear off about it. I primarily specialize in everything to do with the Baldwin Locomotive Works, um, whether that's, you know, lining and decorative artwork on locomotives, lettering styles applied. I definitely rely on extensive networks of friends and acquaintances to help me, you know, fact check everything I do and stuff like that. And I am so grateful for having met everybody. Hey, uh, I'm theater. Mainly I focus on the locomotives equipment and, uh, Whatever information may be relevant towards them. And next is someone you may have heard from before as a modeler, but now you'll be hearing from them as a researcher. Welcome back, Dan. All right. Yeah. um, As Tom said, you'll recognize me from modeling talks, but I'm used to doing all parts of modeling myself. That's my heritage from the trains community. And so my research bake is what I've gathered through 11 years of models. Um, Also, what I've learned as a fireman for the Nevada State Railroad Museum I have experience around this stuff, both in the modeling realm and in person, and so I can help find what appliances are. More on that later. Howdy. I'm uh, Joe Wagman. I'm a lifetime member of the Durango Railroad Historical Society, where I've uh, helped with most of their activities over the last couple of years, um, such as rebuilding their fleet of um, three-foot gauge rolling stock, and I also do some stuff on the uh, Locomotive 315. Uh, currently, I'm a brakeman on the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad. My area of expertise is also producing artwork for the game and the company besides field research. So moving right along, you've now met our research team. And let's start talking about 
What elements of your research aids in the world building to enhance the historical accuracy and immersion of our game? Because that is a really big component that we want to have where we don't just have equipment that looks good, but we want to create an overall feeling, a vibe of being there. And part of that is getting everything you'd see there looking and feeling and sounding right. And starting with that, as far as our world maps and environments, um, just open floor, uh, just start talking a bit about things that y'all have contributed in terms of, um, you know, what we see in the worlds around us, whether it's Ponderosa up in the Sierra Nevada mountains based on the Tahoe region or our second map we've introduced Keystone, which is based on Pennsylvania narrow gauge. Especially for those of us lucky enough to live In our target areas, field research can be as simple as walking outside. I was in Tahoe City the other day and so measured a couple of buildings for us, walked along the old right of way, things like that. I'm very, very lucky in that my mom is something of a naturalist. And so uh, whenever I am in any kind of doubt as to a question that Tom has, I can ask her and pull in that lead as well. So both historical knowledge and current day, you know, regional flora and fauna, everything like that. Mm-hmm. And we, we super appreciate that. And that's one of the n- nice things of having sort of a decentralized team structure is that we <laughs> have team members literally all over the country. So if someone is saying, hey, I'm going to be out in X region at this time, should I get photos there? We can pretty much get coverage of anywhere coast to coast that we need. Yeah. There's actually three of us in the Sierra Nevadas. There's three of us in the Sierra Nevadas, a couple of us in Colorado. Um, and I go to Alturas a lot, and I love the desert in Nevada. Um, yeah. So I'm probably, but Tom, I, I think you're actually the, the closest person to us in Keystone. Yeah. yeah, Ohio is not quite the same. It's a little flatter, not quite, <laughs> not, not quite as bumpy. It's more of a uh, – Ohio is more of a Lay's chip than a ruffle up in the Appalachians, but – um, similar foliage, and so I've been collecting some stuff out here for that. And we've noticed a lot of people are really excited to see East Coast Narrow Gauge. I know a lot of what we've shown already is the Sierra Nevadas and sort of the high desert in the California and Nevada region. We definitely want to emphasize that we are focusing not just on a specific region, but we want to capture as much of the continental U.S. as we can, and we're really excited to show more of that. And one of the things we'll be showing more on these environments is building and architecture. Very glad to nitpick a lot of our building uh, <laughs> and regional design. We have a joke with the president of the Nevada, California, Oregon Railway and I were talking about barns. And we said that there's only one type of barn out west in California. And if you build the wrong one, we know you're not from here. <laughs> so yep. One of the things we want to make sure as we work on the buildings is that We have a cross-section of things that are generic you'd find across the country, but things that are more regional. Um, So I'm looking forward to working on uh, the new map uh, to dig into some of those building designs because I'm so familiar with what we have here. Um, But that allows for a lot of flexibility uh, in having individual regions down the road and and, uh, what we can build on. Yeah, that's that's been the uh, the real struggle is obviously we can't model every single building in every single town. So it's finding a way to condense it into a manageable representation of everything and making things modular or um, v- picking buildings that are versatile for a lot of areas so that we still have specific buildings for each region that are, you know, directly emblematic of that region. But we have um, quite a few that are you know, things that you'll find anywhere and striking that balance really helps with workload and project scope. You mean to tell me that not every town is Minden, Nevada? Not every town is, but Minden is really good for resources <laughs> for that. Yeah. I mean, so, some of the towns we've looked at, um, Nevada City, um, Carson City, a um, couple of buildings from Eureka, Nevada. Silverton is a good one for more of an intermountain kind of architecture. And that's really one of the things that we've you know, been discovering more through the research is little architectural quirks and regional variations. Um, like up in Tahoe, the railings on balconies and second stories tends to use flatter pieces of carved planks of wood rather than something turned on a lathe like you might see more in the Colorado area. So getting those regional variations and making them as uh, modular part swapping in buildings is going to be really fun for representing specific locales. And then that research is also going into industries and 
commodities as well. So not just focusing on the look of industries to be right for, you know, a generic sense, but focusing specifically on how are these industries different in certain regions? How were commodities in specific regions handled? And we that's one of the things that we've really been trying to work towards as a team is um, the last few months and probably the next few months after this is really putting our heads down and getting it to the point where we can haul a revenue commodity train in Century Steam. That's going to be a big milestone for us. And it's not going to be the end. We'll have a lot more of a way to go after that. But that will be another thing where once we can do that, we can you know, be really happy with ticking another box of things we want to do for this project. The process for uh, some of these goods, uh, what was hauled, what was created from the byproduct, um, what an industry could resell possibly just from a waste component that could be used elsewhere down the line. Because a lot of times in, I've always felt that in uh, games centered on railroad related industries, they're really simplified, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's things that we've talked about like straw or, or wood chips or sawdust being used as insulating materials and things like that, that a lot of people don't realize. Um, when you look at how uh, we were talking about handling ice and how you had to manage an ice house throughout a year, depending on what climate you're in, um, how do you generate ice in the desert or how do you store that all year? And a lot of that builds into how we are setting up a lot of this world building where it's not so much that you're hauling from one place to a black hole, um, but you are able to see these buildings and industries in their relationship to town or the countryside as uh, an actual economic chain, which I think is really great. And then a second layer of detail on our buildings and industries and other structures and even our rolling stock is the paint itself. You'd be surprised how much really meticulous, really unique kind of research methods go into getting the paint for these things. Uh, so I'll again hand this back to Andrew as well. So the way that um, I approach paint research uh, is how I would handle this in a museum setting. Um, how I've worked with my colleagues from other museums and organizations over the years to do this is you use uh, what we would call a paint window. It's a method where you sand through the layers of paint down to the substrate, um, usually the wood or metal or whatever that is, and work out the date of the substrate and count those layers as they build out to the existing exterior. You then look at them under a microscope and you determine what is a layer of primer or what might be a layer of paint with a layer of varnish or their remnants of striping. And this process has to be done in person. Uh, we have to physically travel to do this. I've been doing it for many, many years now. Uh, and a lot of the research that we are able to tap into was, hand was performed by, again, my colleagues, other people, uh, railroad museums that publish uh, restoration or feasibility studies might outline the paint layers they find. Um, professional conservationists are also out there that have done reports. So I've worked with Western Railway Museum, uh, my own Nevada County Narrowgate Museum that I volunteer with, uh, folks back in Maine and across the country um, looking at paint layers. Uh, I've, I've gone to the Colorado Railroad Museum and been given permission to attack uh, artifacts with sandpaper, is how I would describe it. And um, you learn a lot. You learn that when you can take paint layers, and, and especially if you're fortunate enough to have a company do a diagram to help take you through when the layers change, you learn a lot of, of really fascinating things about the era that, from a model railroader perspective, where I started out as a kid, they're not the things that you would accept. Like, you would think, oh, yeah, you know, all the cars were always Pullman green. They have black trucks, and, and you have all of, you know, these simple answers, which were like a simple answer from the 20s, you know, that their grandpa told uh, a young modeler or something like that. And what you find is that there are wonderful specimens 
of historic paint out there. Uh, I've been fortunate to look at Central Pacific cars dating back to the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, early Rio Grande cars, and start to put together a sense of what all of this looks like. Um, some of you may recognize my work. I do illustrations of cars as they would have looked that circulate online. I've done uh, various talks at Narragany National Convention with my friend Randy Hees and others uh, on this topic. Um, and the simple thing I like to tell everybody is um, it doesn't hurt to look. You know, if we tell everybody or we tell ourselves that, well, this was figured out 40 years ago and this is just the way we've always looked at it, that's a very easy way to look at it. But a lot can be gained from just taking the time and effort to go do some physical research, to sand down paint layers. Um, and that process is not too time-consuming. It takes a little practice. I have certainly butchered a couple things over the years. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, when we look at all of this, we take those paint layers and... Um, put together a timeline of what, what everything should be. And then you match that to some sort of a color system, which is an important part of the process. Paint layers themselves, you have to kind of treat them um, a little differently. Older oil-based paints, as they dry out, we generally wet them with oil or water, if that's all we have available, allow them to be exposed to natural sunlight to help kind of restore the pigment. Then you take those paint layers and match them to a color system. We frequently use Pantone, uh, which is actually a printing color system, but it's also the easiest and most portable to use in the field or the easiest to get started with. Um, systems like Munsell, there are other systems out there, but a lot of those require very specific controlled environments where you have to have uh, a color, a light lab, <clears throat> and you have to look at them on a microscopic level. That is excellent when you have the time to do that. Uh, not everybody does. So we have to work with the best tool available uh, when you're out in the field, and that happens to be Pantone. The fortunate thing about using Pantone is that they provide you the references for uh, CMYK or hexadecimal color uh, with conversions. It's called a color bridge is one of the ones I have. Um, and that helps us move beyond just the paint world to interpreting it into a digital sense for art. Obviously, you can't pick a Pantone number and go get paint from that, but you can use it to create a representation, a visual representation. Um, in our paint talks, one of the things I bring up is our eyes perceive color differently. So the way I see a certain color may differ from someone else. Someone, others might be colorblind. They're not going to see color in the way that the rest of us do. So a lot of this process is done comparatively with others, where I work with a couple of people who I know can see visually the color kind of in the same spectrum I do. Um, and so I'll bounce my ideas or thoughts off of them when we're doing comparative analysis. Um, but we use that then to create a digital sense of what that color is. Um, and I think we'll show some examples. I, I sent some in of uh, paint windows, as we call them, where you sand through. Um, one of them, one of my favorites, was a passenger car on the Sierra Railway that had been used in movie service and had the most layers of paint I've ever seen on a railroad car. So many that the beaded groove edge of the siding is completely smooth from paint. And I think it was like 41 paint layers. Um, and almost all of them are movie paint and just spectacular colors, but not really railroad service that we're looking for. Well, that's still almost neat in that you can go through the history of its film career just by the layers of paint on the car. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, there's a couple of them I can identify for sure from different movies. Um, and at least a couple, like there's the bright yellow, which I'm pretty sure is the color from around the time of uh, when they shot the footage for 
Tales of Wells Fargo and other movies uh, back in the very early 50s. I want to say, but they, those cars are always, even in black and white, the black and white footage are very light, obviously bright colors, and there's that bright banana yellow right there on the car. Wow, that's, that's again, incredible. And, for, you know, on the tail end, what pl- people playing the game see, they might just see a hex code, but the amount of work that goes into getting that hex code is a lot more than, you know, maybe they may have considered. And so that's a, a neat opportunity to dive into that in this episode. And something else that we haven't really spoken about a whole lot, but we're going to talk about it a lot more soon, is player attire. We have been working on getting references together for player models and people for the game. And we have someone lined up to do that work. But what we've been doing on the research end, and Josh and Andrew can talk about this further, is the clothes that railroaders would have worn throughout our titular century of steam and maybe how they differ from how the general public today thinks an engineer or a fireman or a conductor may look. Yeah, so when uh, Tom said a couple weeks ago there was about time to start thinking about the uh, player characters are super excited because uh, I used to volunteer at Golden Spike National Historic Park uh, Promontory Summit, Utah, which um, was obviously that was that was the place where the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. They had their Golden Spike ceremony, and the Park Service would provide us with period clothing to use when we were volunteering on the locomotives, and it was pretty bland. And I was like, I need to find out more about how railroaders would dress in the 19th century. So I did, I, you know, for the past several years, I've done very deep dives into clothing. Um, for example, um, not all railroads had this rule, but most railroads actually did not allow um, crews to wear red clothing, apart from the bandana, uh, because from a distance that could be confused with a red flag. Um, so that was one of the first rules we set down, the baseline rules for character design is you're not going to have red shirts, not going to have red coats, red hats or red pants. Um, be, because um, it was a safety issue. Red was generally reserved for signaling. And there, there's a lot of other things. For example, I, I, I decided that I need, we needed to track down exactly when the stereotypical engineer's hat showed up. Um, I assumed it was about 1900. Turns out it didn't actually appear really on the market. The, uh, the hickory-striped cloth hat with the cloth brim didn't show up on the market for railroaders until the mid 1920s. So it's not appropriate at all for the 19th century. Um, which was kind of a, a kind of a surprise because that's the one piece of clothing apart from the overalls that everyone associates with a railroader or a railroad crew. Um, so, um, similarly, like, uh, in current times, the bowler hat has become very popular in preservation at tourist railroads and museums. Um, but turns out the bowler hat was not popular among real railroaders when the bowler hat was commonly worn because it was very easy to knock off your head. And there's actually a story of an engineer on Marshall Pass in Colorado. Um, he left his cap at home, so he had to wear his bowler hat. And within five minutes of his trip, he hit the hat on the windowsill, knocked it off, and it rolled down the mountain and never saw it again. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, a, lot, a lot of very interesting things, a lot of uh, good um, base rules that we're setting that are based on historical practice to really make sure that these character models mat- or meet the, uh, the the period aesthetic of the time so that it's it's more accurate than just like a spaghetti western or like a generic imagination of what 19th century and early 20th century railroading was. Yeah, that's the main thing is that a lot of people either through Hollywood or video games like Red Dead or a lot of other public media um, have a lot of ideas of what they think 19th century attire or architecture or, you know, general illustration or design look like. But one of the things we want to do with this game is kind of help people to get a fresh look at what things really looked like and, you know, sort of demystifying and deconstructing some of those tropes and um you know players we hope are going to be a great way to feel in character when you're exploring this world and we will have more on that as that progresses but as far as the work going into it there has been a lot of really neat research being done and speaking of research done for appearances 
Um, we've been looking at a lot of historical documents, not just for the information that they give, but the style in which they are given. Um, the general appearance of railroad documents and railroad paraphernalia over the time is sort of our current direction for UI appearance. Um, we are constantly changing it, and they're going to change continually until probably the game's launch. But one of the things that we really wanted to do is use the appearance of railroad documents like timetables or waybills or railroad passes in styling our user interface so that any time you're being pulled out of the world to look at a menu, it can still feel like you're looking at something in the universe that a railroader might have on hand. So that's going to be a fun thing that we'll be delving into. And then to pivot a bit um, from the previous paint discussion, uh, we will look at also some non-rolling stock paint. So um, some general paint practice for buildings, advertisement, and as aforementioned, documentation. Uh, so I will pass that back to Andrew. We have looked into how things were painted appropriately. A lot of that comes again from research that Josh and myself and others have done into building paints, uh, particular practices. Uh, one of the things I will bring up and often mention to people is white. It, as we understand white as a trim color, is really not appropriate uh, for Victorian buildings. A large reason for that was uh, white paints outside of using just pure white lead. You had to make something like a whitewash, uh, maybe an off-white. Uh, a lot of times those were not very durable paints. They were inexpensive, but you had to repaint frequently. And a fine building usually wouldn't have white outside of maybe some small decorative trim for the economic reason, but also for a stylistic reason. Buildings were thought of as something that should exist in the area that they're built in. They should look as, as if they belong there. Um, and that was a, a term used back then called the harmony of color, that the building should harmonize with its surroundings. And the only thing, there was an author by the name of Downing who kind of invented the modern garden, and you could say was close to Martha Stewart of the era in uh, character-wise in the 1840s. Uh, Downing said that a white building doesn't harmonize with anything unless maybe it was in an open field where it could harmonize with the clouds. So you wouldn't really paint a house, a fine house, that way. Now, if it's a railroad building, a utility building, a farm building, um, if it's on the side of town where people are, are not able to afford nice paints or, or regular maintenance or even a fine house, then you would see that substituted for, uh, you know, uh, used out in that area. But what we would typically call a Victorian house or your later Queen Anne's, you generally follow uh, a practice of using complementary body and trim color with contrasting color for window sashes and doors, the, the parts that move that are active on the building. I have a friend whose house uh, was painted a two-tone green, so he had a light green body with dark green trim and a vermilion red door and window sashes. And, and that would be a perfectly historically accurate uh, uh, building design. So we go from every level of, we can look at the locomotive paint and the car paint and then down into the building paint. Every level of this, uh, the goal is to make it look the way it was. Um, so you'll see a lot of colors that are light-toned colors, yellows, uh, grays were acceptable colors, oddly enough. You could paint your house two-tone gray, and that would be far more acceptable visually, artistically, and maybe even socially on a level than having a pure white house downtown, though there are exceptions to that rule. So we look at everything from even barns, your simple barn. A lot of times when we see black and white photographs of barns, they look very rough and haggard. If a building is new, you might actually catch a picture of it unpainted. But anybody back then would have looked at a building and said, okay, it's got to have some paint on it, unless it absolutely couldn't afford it. But the wood that was used in the construction of barns, the lumber, was typically rough cut. So it has a rougher appearance. It's not finished and fine and smooth like what you'd see on a house. So in photographs, you can also often misinterpret what you're seeing on the barn as just being the rough cut wood 
uh, the grain and the variation therein as being unpainted. So we've made an attempt to make sure that buildings have some sort of a cheap uh, paint on them, mineral paints, which the term mineral paint means it's a paint derived from mineral sources like stone, dirt, things like that. Metallic obviously means it comes from uh, a metallic source, irons, lead, uh, things like that. Uh, so cheap mineral paints, which literally, ingredient-wise, um, are refined dirts and clays mixed with linseed oil and a drying agent, were common on barns. Finer houses, again, you'd have two or three layers of different colored paint as you go on. Fences could have a whitewash. They could have different colors. Trestles on railroads and turntables and railroad buildings were often painted with fireproof paints, which were usually heavily metallic, sometimes had uh, asbestos added as a uh, fire retardant. Um, and we have great examples to reference from trade cards and uh, existing fireproof paints. So we're as diligent as we are as everything else uh, in making sure that we're presenting an appearance of what life would have looked like back then. And that's the that's the fun thing is that reality from what you've been able to discern from it is in a lot of cases more vibrant and colorful than Hollywood shows it. Like you look at any spaghetti western and often it's, you know, kind of half rotten, unpainted wood. People took better care of it than it was shown in film sets and it helps add a lot more life to the world. Yeah, I mean, this stuff was meant to last. And it was very personal. You were probably the person who painted your own. So you took the time to do decorations the way you wanted to, but you still wanted them to fit in. You know, so mm. there's a lot of room for variation and, and how we can play with color in that space. And so we, we've spent a lot of time so far talking about the research and the field uh, studies that go into gathering the materials to make graphics for the game. Now let's start looking at the next step down the pipeline, which is starting to translate it to a digital form. So... Eric, if you want to take this section, um, we have some examples of lining you have done for Baldwin styles, how you go from something like a Baldwin paint standard card to a digital asset, and tell us a bit how you make those. Well, um, the first thing you really got to do when you consider paint like this is you got to look at photographs and the Baldwin style books. The style books, um, they were recently digitized. They've been a part of the collection in the library at Stanford University for a while. They were digitized finally in, I believe it would have been February of 2021. And I remember being really excited about it. Um, uh, and I was actually talking to Andrew about it back then when, uh, when it dropped. And I was like, Oh my God, look at this. You start there because the style books are a system of paint cards which describe certain areas of a locomotive. And basically, you have to sort of figure out in your head from the card what the proportions of all the line work should be, what should go where, what color it needs to be, stuff like that. And then you also need to look at existing photographs. If you can find photographic references of the specific locomotive you're kind of looking at, great. That's, that's absolutely perfect. But there's also other engines where you can sort of see like, okay, it looks a little bit maybe elongated on this particular aspect of it because the tender is longer or maybe it's like really short, stuff like that. And you just kind of reconcile that, I guess. You've got to make it fit uh, because that was the design practice uh, back then to the best of my understanding. You could use the cards... Um, as long as, as it was like, let's say, if you're working on a tender engine, you could use any style that was specifically for tender engines on any engine, as long as it made sense. The, so I start with those. I basically look at, okay, what is the baseline Baldwin style card telling me to do? And then do I have really cool photographic references or do I have other materials that have already been created by other researchers whom I uh, rely upon. And then I go in and I try to recreate with the best detail that I can everything that I see. That's really the kind of long and short of it. So that's basically my whole thing. I absolutely love the process. This is kind of how I unwind at the end of the day. So it's just all, all a bunch of fun for me. Um, just to give you a quick taste of what we can do. Um, I've got 
four different card examples put together already to show what something possibly could like. Um, I'm not saying that every uh, every single paint is going to be on every single engine, of course. We need to keep in mind, like, okay, what would have actually been possible for this locomotive? I'll probably get into all of the meat and potatoes of it in a in a different video, just explaining what it is, um, what the style s system is, how it works, and all these unique little things that I found over time. Uh, so we've got that, and then I've got on Lake Brown a actual historical example from the North Pacific Coast Railroad. And then uh, we're also looking definitely not just before 1900. We've also got uh, post-1900. Um, you do kind of need to rail back against some of the preconceptions of how these engines would have looked. Um, you've basically got two sort of camps which I've heard about. Uh, you've got like, oh, everything needs to be like a bright red and stuff like that and just look really gaudy, which was considered in poor taste if you actually had done that, but, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood. And then you've also got, like, very dingy, unkempt locomotives that look like they're just about ready to just fall apart at any moment. That's Don't do not... that. You can't inspect a dirty engine. I know, exactly. And, I mean, it's also sort of a mindset, a, sort of like a status thing. Um, as near as I understand it, the, uh, the going idea was like, you know, these were very, like a locomotive is a very important investment for a railroad. And, of course, they wanted to look clean. But also, um, I remember reading an anecdote in uh, Sam Spees Jr.'s book, um, Going Railroadin, during the 1880s or so, the Denver South Park and Pacific employed uh, teenagers to wipe down engines with, like, oiled cloths to make them look absolutely spotless, because that was just sort of the ethos. I mean, these were kind of the rocket ships of, of their day. You wanted them to look nice. So, yes, they're they're going to look fantastic. That's just kind of how it was back then. Thank you again, Eric, for um, giving that insight. And let's also talk about something else you've been working on, is initial work for our catalog system. And as a preface to this, um, a lot of people have been asking us, you know, does Century of Steam have a tech tree of locomotives? And the answer is no, uh, we haven't. And w the reason for that is we don't think a tech tree system really is effective for the way that people would have ordered locomotives in the time period. If you went to Baldwin and said, I would like one Mikado, please, they wouldn't say, oh, sorry, um, but you don't have enough experience as a railroader to buy this Mikado. Come back after you've gotten more XP. And so for that reason, we've gone with more of a catalog system where um, the locomotives you have available to you are gated by era. And then whichever era you are in, you have that catalog that you can then order from. And of course, you'll have the back catalogs if you want to order something older in a later period. But the unlocking of new equipment will be determined by the passage of time rather than the accumulation of stuff. Um, just, as a, just as a disclaimer, I reserve the right to uh, change anything I want on this because, you know, it is a preliminary version. Yep, always but, a work in progress. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but the going idea with this was I was having a look at the pre-1900 Baldwin Illustrated Catalog. And so... There's a few of them, which I've got. There's an 1872 catalog, an 1881 catalog, both of which are uh, primarily standard gauge. And then there's three narrow gauge catalogs, one from 1877, another from 1885, and then one from 1900. And so the 1885 one really caught my eye because of all of this really just wonderful lining and then just really nice table placement of all these different specifications, how the builder's photographs were laid out. Um, and so I was like, hmm, I want to do this. And, you know, since, since they're not really held under copyright anymore to quote a meme, um, it's free real estate. <laughs> so, um, I thought that it would be just, you know, a good idea. I mean, if it, if the concept already exists and we want to, you know, recreate it as much as we can, why not do it? And so that's what I did. Um, I, I uh, took a lot of inspiration from the the lining for the general feel of it. Um, changed up some of the layout so that it works really well on computer screens and just for user interface and clarity. 
but I mean, we've got all the necessary stuff, um, specifications, um, a hauling co- a capacity table, which I ended up uh, creating a metric to calculate myself for um, any locomotives we do end up adding, uh, which is nice. And then um, we go in for a deep dive on history to really also kind of use this as a teaching tool because there's a lot of really fascinating in, um, information. Um, and we really want to just, you know, make that information public and so that everybody can enjoy it. Um, we even have the references at the bottom. And so, yeah, it was just kind of like, oh, I like this. I want to do it. And then I did it. These catalogs were really made to help people understand the type of locomotives available for what type of work they needed. And so, you know, that made for a really good template of helping players to decide, well, what locomotive do I need for this certain job? And we're really excited to be able to share the historical testimony in that extra tab because historically Baldwin in their catalogs included letters from the railroads of, hey, we ordered this locomotive, we ran it on a train from here to here with this kind of hauling up this kind of grade at this sort of speed, and they'll give basically a performance readout. And that's not only good for knowing as a player what a locomotive can do, but it's useful for us as developers to have essentially a performance benchmark for calibrating our simulation. If we know that a locomotive could do a certain task in a certain amount of time with a certain load, if our simulation doesn't do that, we can recalibrate it to ensure that it can. A really common story that comes up is, you know, can an 818C hit 40 miles an hour? And this is essentially where that claim comes from, is we have a letter from the Eureka and Palisade Railroad of one of their 440s with a single coach in tow, running the 90-something miles from Eureka to Palisade, which is essentially all uphill, in an average of 34 to 35 miles an hour. And that's including station and fuel stops. So mathematically, it very likely would have hit 40. And that was confirmed in the preservation era by Dan Markoff, um, mm-hmm. which that's a whole story in itself. I highly re- recommend you read into that if you can. But this sort of information is really great, not just for knowing how it's supposed to operate, but getting sort of that firsthand feedback of really the connections people had to these and putting them to the test and doing these cool feats with them. You know, pretty soon one day, we hope that you'll be able to set your own kind of experiences with them and be able to tell your friends, oh, I was able to pull this off with this engine. And you'll essentially be a new generation of sharing that kind of testimony. And so we, we've talked a lot so far about things that you should do, it, you know, if you want to get into research. But let's talk about a few faux pas, a few don'ts of the sort of researching field. First up, lettering. Um, you'll notice there are a lot of fonts that are listed in a font library or a font shop as sort of Wild West or Western or Old West. And I'll let Andrew and Josh and Eric talk a little bit about how that might be a little misleading. So I was actually just reading uh, John Ott's little article about uh, Old West sign lettering. One of the things that uh, we very frequently see is the use of fonts like Playbill or what do you call it, dry goods. There's a couple of them where they are kind of like in a what you call an Egyptian typeface, but with really heavy set block top and, and bottom, like the, the feet. These are very specific fonts for the 19th century the, that were used. I mean, Playbill literally was used by Playbill for the stage and theater. It's a print typeface. It's not something that would really be appropriate uh, on a building. And thankfully, there are a lot of people who have recognized this. There are a lot of great photographs of stores that we can reference. Um, and we've made a really strong push to steer away from using too many of those or, you know, the, or Oklahoma, which are very interesting font faces, but they also do come from prints from carnival posters and things like that. So we've pushed further into trying to have lettering that would be appropriate for the whole range of buildings we're looking at. And in many cases, that's meant that uh, we've had to make typefaces. And Josh can talk a bit about that, as he's made quite a few. The the great thing about the digital age and uh, public domain law is that so many old trade manuals 
um, from the 1920s and earlier are now fully digitized and online, which makes our research a little bit easy. You know, you have to, we have to find these books first. They're not very hard to find through keyword searches. Um, but once we find these manuals, um, they give us like basically step by step instructions on how sign painters carried out their trade, the, the, how, what their lettering would look like, different, the different, um, lettering styles. I, Andrew and I hesitate to use the word fonts because that, the, the fonts came a lot later. In print, it'd be like a typeface or, or a face, but a font is, is more like the digital. Uh, equivalent of a typeface. So we've we've created several different options that are appropriate for both um, our structures, like the the scenery of the game, and also for the the freight cars. Uh, for example, I uh, called Boston Egyptian. It's in the Egyptian family. Um, it's a very plain font style, but it came directly out of a sign painter's book for advertising. But then, as I was doing further research, I actually found that several railroads that ordered cars from Pullman actually specified using Boston Egyptian on their cars. So these these railroad car painters and Pullman's car painters um, were trained using these handbooks and they were aware of how to use these fonts, or not, I mean, not fonts, obviously, back then. Um, and, and they were just using just standard lettering styles that were available in handbooks that they could get back then. So we're avoiding all these playbill, these modern digital age fonts that you'll Usually, you'll find default on your operating system with your word processor, and we're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And like, especially um, just not just the style of the font, but the legibility is very different as well. Um, you know, a lot of these fonts were made to be advertisements in and of themselves, and so them being very legible from a distance, either on the side of a building or on the side of equipment is an advertisement for a certain uh, commercial center or a railroad. And so if people can read it from farther and it's a very appealing uh, typeface, then, you know, it'll help draw people's eyes. And then another little do's and don'ts section uh, for this part of the, I guess, podcast at this point is how to verify and interpret information, especially knowing the difference of how to use a folio versus a modeling diagram. And in addition, primary versus secondary sources. Especially as a modeler, in order to keep moving and have something to present, we will make a rough pass on anything. You know, you might call this your dirty icing to use a uh, baking parlance. We're going to start with the best diagram we have. We'll interpret it as best we can. And then Andrew will come around and tell us how it's wrong. Uh, and we'll go into some specific examples of that later. But that's part of the process, right? Especially for people who are modelers who do this stuff for other games. What I want to say here is that people verifying your information is really, really important. And it's not just really important when they're verifying that you're correct. It's very, very important when they're verifying that you're wrong and need to change it. And also how you need to change it. Because you might know that what you're doing is imperfect, but for the life of you, you just can't figure out how. That's when you most want someone to check for you because they will either tell you that, nope, you're just right, or they'll tell you how you're wrong and you can fix it. A particular thing that we wanted to highlight is that there are many different types of diagram that are around and um, no diagram at all is absolute. Rule of thumb, a photo is more absolute than a diagram, right? Because a photo marks that something exists, and a diagram at its best is a imperfect representation of reality. So a folio is something produced by a railroad to store dimensions that were important to that railroad. Similar is an erecting card or a general arrangement, which is a diagram produced by the manufacturer to hold important dimensions for assembling the part. So in either case, a folio will frequently look extremely wrong. An erecting card will look very, very correct. But having worked from both, I'll tell you that even an erecting card is not always going to be foolproof, right? They'll make cuts or little things to fit the entire engine on one space. And you will look at that and go, how does that work? But if you're just tracing the diagram, it won't occur to you that they don't work. And that then you'll be scratching your head wondering why it's wrong. But you follow the dimensions and it will be correct. 
and if it's not correct, it will be very easy to correct it. By contrast, if you get a drawing from um, the Narrow Gauge and Shortline Gazette or from Model Railroad or anything like that, those are produced for magazines, and they're produced quite literally for you to lay your model down on the diagram and trace it. So if you're producing stuff visually in that way, they are a much better starting point. But of course, they're secondary sources. So they tend more to make errors that make physical sense or make simplifications that make sense for a model, but aren't representative of the real thing. In this day and age, as someone who understands this stuff really well and can logic out where appliances go, I would much rather use a folio than a model or diagram. But if you have nothing else, model or diagrams are great. Um, they'll let you work from one source for everything. You just have to know that every single thing you're doing is a an inference, right? Very few, if any, of the dimensions are posted. You don't know anything absolutely. No drawing is absolute. So there's a, an important thing about the folio and the erecting drawing. Mm-hmm. Is that they are both, I hate to say, rough drawings. But yeah, they are. Overall diagrams, but they're made in two different fashions, where uh, an erecting drawing is more drawn on the drafting board in a lab, so to speak. Yes. And this is how we these parts should be aligned. Um, a folio drawing, more often than not, was just done for tax and repair purposes and done in the field. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of examples. Denver Rio Grande Coach 256. In several folio diagrams of the car, it changes length, where it's yes. a certain length, and then all of a sudden it's shorter, and then it's longer again. And it created this whole mystery of why did this happen, who did it happen, what all of that, uh, and it was just a mistake. It was just a draft. It was somebody's field notes were wrong. Mm-hmm. The car itself, when it was physically restored, found looking at the framing that it was all the original framing. It had never actually physically changed. So you have to kind of, you know, play the devil in the details there, like what yeah. you said. You know, it, and that's that's part of why I say no drawing is absolute, right? Because right. you can have an excellent, excellent. Um, draftsmen. You know, we've worked with original, uh, freight car detail part diagrams from the Denver and Rio Grande. You know, that these are what were used to cast the parts. And I found errors on them. You know, we found issues with David Fletcher drawings. And David Fletcher is probably the single best modern, uh, draftsman for this stuff. If you have a da- David Fletcher diagram, that's a gold standard, but he's one person right? He's not perfect. Nobody is. Um, and so ultimately you don't trust any one source. You put them all together. You do the best you can from all of those sources. And critically, you accept when you need to fix something. That's the only way to get it perfect. Yeah. If there is one takeaway for an aspiring modeler or aspiring researcher, um, keep an open mind. Always be curious. Check back against as many pieces of information as you can and use some of these tips and tricks to make value judgments on how best to glean the whole story from all the individual components. All right, so after that, we have a pretty good idea of you know people's expertise and the things that we're always constantly thinking about. But let's talk a little bit about how this research is guiding the scope of the project. Um, one of the questions that we are asked constantly is, what locomotives and rolling stock are going to be there? And there's a lot of reasons to keep that list internal, but we wanted to share our thought process of how we curate that so that you can infer from that sort of the decisions we're making um, so that you can understand sort of where we're coming from. <laughs> um, something else we should also talk about, white notation, you know, referring to a locomotive by the wheel arrangement, like a 440 or a 260, didn't exist until the early 1900s. Um, yeah, so White comes up with his design right around 1900, 1901. He presents it, and he's very, very fortunate in that Alco picks it up and promotes it really heavily. That's the main reason why we use White today. Before then, you had common understandings of what an arrangement is, and they weren't strict 
to the exact wheel configuration, right? A double ender is a 242 or a 262 or a 282. There's no real understanding of what that means. And so we include white because it would be much more confusing for people otherwise. But that is one of our historical concessions. And it's a pretty major one for how much people will take it for granted. Yeah, like if you look through the 1885 or 1881 Baldwin Illustrated catalogs, you will not see 440 listed. You will see American Standard. Especially in the late 1860s, early 1870s, it is an American if it's a 440, right? Anything that has that three-point suspension. An American Standard is a 16 by 24 uh, 440. Oh, I didn't um, realize that was a distinction. Ew. Me neither. Yeah, or, or, or a 16 by 22, but at least that is what I have seen is the standard was the standard, right? If you ordered an American from McQueen, you would get the same engine as everybody else. And that was a huge revolution, right? Because... Classes don't exist in the 1870s. We talk about a class 818C, but an 818C is just a 440 with 12 inch diameter cylinders. It doesn't mean anything more than that. Um, and it's and also so, very important to note that an 818C <laughs> is just in Baldwin parlance. Every other builder yes. might have had their own systems, and so that's another thing to keep track of. Yeah, Port- Porter would call them what a... Uh... <laughs> it, would, it would be a B4T, right? B4T, yes, that's correct. So yeah. looking looking into sort of the scope and guidance of what locomotives and rolling stock we are curating for the project, uh, we have a few questions we ask ourselves before we determine if a locomotive is viable. Because as with structures in saying that we can't model every single structure from coast to coast, obviously we can't make every single three-foot narrow-gauge locomotive that ever existed, that would simply not be feasible with the time or resources we have. But there are certain emblematic examples that, in broad brush strokes, give really good examples of what would have been available to a new railroad, because ultimately the goal of Century Steam is you are a fledgling railroad company looking to build a three-foot railroad, And we want to give the options that a railroad ordering new equipment by catalog might have encountered and are the, you know, some of the more common things that they would have picked. And so the first of those questions is, is it a catalog design? If so, definitely use it. We want to make sort of the first round of equipment be the things that went just about anywhere, whether it's the 1024E280 or the 818C440 like you've seen in some of our other development logs. Um, These locomotives being ordered by a bunch of companies being built in massive quantities means there are a lot of references to get customization and detailed variety from, so that one locomotive can become trillions, or in the case of the 818C, 11.5 quintillion unique combinations of detail just mechanically. And so that gives us a ton of range and a ton of versatility, so that even though there's fewer base structures of locomotives, you can turn them into many, many more things to make your unique style for your unique railroad. If it's not a specific commonplace catalog design, we think, how can we represent the country as best as we can? So if we're looking at Mikado's as a specific wheel arrangement, we think about, can we represent multiple roads with them? And can we get a lot of regional variety for that? And and with the exception of one, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that's the thing is Mikados are very region specific for specific classes, um, but sometimes locomotives are not just owned by one specific railroad. They will be bought and sold by multiple owners. And so the next question we ask is, was this equipment found on multiple roads and did it have several service lives? A good example of that would be something like the Nevada, California, Oregon 10-wheelers or the Florence and Cripple Creek 10-wheelers, both of which started on one railroad that folded fairly early and then became a source of many different railroads as that equipment was scattered to the four winds. Um, Another question we will ask is about use case. So is there a specific use case or an advantage or a quirk to a design that provides a unique operational potential or operational experience? So in the case of something like geared steam, does it offer you know a unique way of putting the power down? In the case of something high driver, does it provide a lot of potential for speed? 
in the case of something with a short wheelbase, is it really useful for going around sharp corners? So one of the criteria we think about are the actual physical dimensions and how it can handle different trains and different track arrangements so that if you build your railroad a certain way, you may be predisposed to using certain designs. And if you build it a different way, then other designs become viable to you. If none of those are the case, then we get into the very messy and wide, wide world of one-offs. And one-offs, of course, being an individual prototype or maybe a very small class of prototypes that only went to one railroad or only had one example built. And the question we ask before we consider those is, do these individual prototypes fill a void for things like a regional representation or a specific use case that an entire class cannot? And one of the wheel arrangements that this will most likely come into play in is prairies, 262s, because on three foot narrow gauge, there were quite a few built, but yeah. they were all very different. And so another great way that research is, you know, making it into our physical models is not just curation of scope, but also making revisions of things we've already started. So next we will talk about the making of two pieces of equipment, one that you have seen, one that you haven't. The one that you have seen before is the Carter Brothers Caboose. Yeah, so with the Carter Caboose, we knew we wanted that car specifically, and we knew generally who had made the diagrams what their sources were for the diagrams, we thought we had it pretty much all figured out. Uh, I wound up rebuilding it twice. So we started with the best drawings we had, cross-checking against what we knew of the prototype. SBC Caboose number 47 still exists. Our main real-life basis, both for the drawings and for the model. I went through the exterior of that, got to the point where I was largely happy with it, started working on the interior, and immediately realized that the sources I had were insufficient. So our original interior came from partial section views of the cars as rebuilt on the Southern Pacific. Uh, it also came from a high-detail model that Andrew purchased um, partway through our, our model construction. And, you know, standard gauge Carter Brothers practice, we knew what Carter Brothers coaches looked like, just not these specific cars, which are a lot more bare bones than a coach. There's no sound floor, there's no sound roof. Even now, a lot of the fine interior details draw heavily from surviving contemporaries, like VT First Caboose 1 and Southern Pacific Number 1010, which is another Carter Caboose even, but uh, not one of this exact type. We'll include a couple of references from how the, the interior gets rebuilt over time, but originally I had things like baggage racks uh, taking, you know, hints from VT cars, and we realized that that almost certainly wasn't going to be the thing. Similarly, we looked at the framing that was shown on uh, restoration studies and built out interior paneling based on that but what we realized was that the paneling was not present in the surviving car and we had to kind of reconstruct that midway through my first rebuild of the interior i actually had the whole thing textured and ready to go in game and uh andrew said so i got in contact with john hall who's in charge of sbc 47 now and um he um uh, works for the uh, Society for the Preservation of Carter Railroad Resources, or the SPCRR. Uh, they're located down in Fremont, California, and have the actual SPC 47 there. Uh, he's been writing the restoration report, so I was talking to him about something else, and I brought it up. And we started comparing notes and made Daniel's life miserable. I am genuinely so much happier with the car as it is now because during the Great Western Steam Up in 2022, we had Southern Pacific number 401 on the narrow gauge train. And I was conducting one of those days, uh, actually two of those days, but only one was on the narrow gauge train. And I was conducting from Caboose 401. And after revising the interior, and after completing the details for the Southern Pacific era, I posed a camera in that shot and realized that I recognized the car. And that's what we're here for. The moment of being an equipment that you've worked on in real life and knowing by feel what everything should be and where things go, that's what we're aiming for with this game. So... It was a very proud moment when you finally got it. Thank you for sharing um, the, the backstory behind that, because 
Um, when we had first shown that in, I believe, customization part two, you know, a lot of people just see, oh, neat, pretty car with all these mm -hmm. neat interiors and just so some of the behind the scenes story of, you know, the, the amount of work that went into getting that right. And it looks so very fantastic now. So thank you so much to all of you for, you know, the, the work you've put in to get that as exacting as you can. Just to give a, a quick reference. Since this was the first piece where we were tracking our, our hours, I tracked hours from the time I started it till the time I exported it for the game. And I put in a total of 65 hours of modeling and texturing for the Carter Brothers car. Yeah, these things don't come easier quick. There is... <laughs> I, I hope that puts in perspective just how much work is going into making every yeah. single piece of this. And speaking of, you know, every single piece, we have a new piece to talk about. Um, Dan, you're making a Shea. Yes, I am. And uh, because I knew where we were going here, I also looked at that. As of right now, I have 88 hours logged in the Shea. Which, so. which considering how mechanically <laughs> complex it is, especially for a three truck, you need to give yourself more credit for like, it. it is a lot of hours, but you do work quickly given the kind of work it is. Yeah. We talked about use case and we talked about that we are specifically using a three truck Shea here. So there's a couple of considerations we wanted to take in with our first geared locomotive. They're odd machines in that the raw figures don't make that much sense for them. If you look at the most popular designs of Shea, especially on the narrow gauge, they are class A two cylinder Shea's. And the tractive effort they put out is pretty paltry. The difference, the thing that makes the Shays special, the original Shays, is specifically that they were able to put out that amount of tractive effort and their maximum amount of horsepower at two miles an hour. And they would happily run all day at two miles an hour. And anyone who has ever had the chance to open the throttle on the Glenbrook or the Eureka will tell you that those locomotives will not go two miles an hour. They won't do it. Um, they will either go faster or they will stall. So if you're trying to run up steep hills where you can only do two miles an hour, those are not viable, even though they have the same amount of tractive effort. So we wanted something that was going to do that, but we also wanted something that was going to make sense to the average player who is looking at tractive effort. And we chose a larger Shea in part because of that. That use yeah. case is going to give it, especially on Ponderosa, where we have designed it as essentially our smaller, more compact maps that'll be a great place for Shays to find their niche and be useful on people's railroads. But there's a lot of components that go into it, not just the model that Dan has been working on, but also the sourcing of the information for it and finding the paint and lettering for that. Yeah, um, so we'll we'll go through sourcing the information. This was very much a collaborative process and then I'll hand off to Eric to talk about specifically the lettering and Andrew will probably want to chime in about the lettering too because it was a time. In terms of what prototype we wanted to use. We had all of these considerations for overall what shades we want to offer, but in terms of the first geared engine we wanted to make, we had a very specific request, which is it needed to be three truck, because that's going to be the most complicated use case that the code has to deal with. So with that in mind, we chose the most popular three truck locomotive. At present, you could represent about nine locomotives with this model, which Compare that to a hundred eight eighteen Cs or ten twenty four Es. They're not popular engines by any stretch. Or even the thirteen ton class A Shays had a hundred engines built. But these are the most popular three truck geared locomotive on the narrow gauge. Critically, they are also what the public would recognize the best. Right, I say 60 ton three truck and people have a general idea what that means. But I say West Side Lumber Company 14 and 15 or Roaring Camp 7, everybody who's in this space will probably have a general idea of what I'm talking about. It is in line with people's touchstones with railroading and that's another tough balance is how do you balance between what people know and what people in the time period would have known. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's a huge concern for us, right? Because we are nerds and we know that, that we would have a lot of fun with this game if we did all the catalog things. We have to balance out what the public knows and loves. And this was the best balance we could strike in that regard. I also am just very happy because, uh, 
You say Westside Lumber Company 14 and 15. I say Sierra Nevada Wooden Lumber Company 10 and 9. They're local machines to me. But for sourcing information, we had a couple of diagrams for 15 specifically that we wanted to use. We also, of course, had ready access to 14 since it's at the Colorado Rail Museum. And that came in really handy because as much as, as much as these drawings are fantastic and they are measured to the real thing and they include it in in-service modifications and all that, there are points where I look at the piping and I go, where does this go? I know how 6ET works. I know all the brake layout. What is this pipe doing? It takes Mark going out there and tracking the pipes down on the physical engine and telling me this is where the pipe goes for me to know where the pipe goes. When we're talking about the limitations of diagrams, that's part of it. Of course, these are logging engines. And so another part of the struggle with this engine in particular is that I have to choose, you know, I'm trying to represent nine engines. In reality, I'm cho- I'm representing 15 as it was in 1966 with as many variations as I can wrap my head around because the piping on these engines has changed. It's changed in preservation. Westside installed straight air brakes on most of their chaise late in life, and Georgetown Loop, as far as I can tell, removed them from 14. 15 still has them, as of most of the photos I've seen. Yeah, that, that's the other <laughs> the tough thing to balance as a modeler is if you have locomotives that went to so many places and you can have so many versions of piping, how do you condense that into yes. an amount that is manageable? <clears throat> yeah, we also want our details to matter to people. When we first started showing off customization, we had people asking about how much of this is cosmetic, how much matters, and how much should we care about that? Especially when it comes to logging engines, that's a very fine balance to tread because a ton of it is purely cosmetic, right? Mm-hmm. If I have the air compressor on one side of the engine versus the other that doesn't affect its performance even if i have a cast frame versus a built up frame all that affects on the engine is the weight but it changes hugely the look of the locomotive and so a logging fan is going to want a ton of customization on these the general public probably isn't and so we want to strike a balance of offering things that everybody can use as a difference Versus things that hardcore fans of this type of railroading will see and get really excited. Yep, and that's exactly why part of what we changed based on your feedback is separating out mechanical from cosmetic differences in the customization so that you can know, okay, this is just to make the locomotive look the way I want. And this is something that's going to change my operational experience with this in the game. Although... um. Speaking of little details that are impossible to pin down, Eric, you want to talk about lettering? Uh, <laughs> so when I uh, when I found out that this was going to be our new project, and I got all excited because you know I've I've been a lifelong logging fan. I was really excited about doing the lettering work for it, and so I got to work with a few reference photographs that Andrew very kindly sent me. And right after I basically started working, Andrew gave me the best advice possible. He said something to the effect of, um, it's too perfect. Andrew, would you say that it's sort of like a, like a mindset thing you got to get yourself into for this? You have to, yeah, like I, I touched on that a little bit about thinking like a sign painter. And with Westside engines, they were touched up by the engine crews or... They didn't have a professional car painter to do this work. And the advice I kind of gave you, because I know you come from a music background, is that this is more like jazz, right? Like, it's not so structured. So don't make everything symmetrical. It should look weird. Like, there's not always a nice rounded corner. Sometimes it's dog-eared. Put yourself in the shoes of that guy out there sweating in the summer and make it look lived in. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm so looking at I'm looking fun. at the one right in the middle, and it looks like it was cut out of you know the the uh, cliche like ransom note that's cut out of magazine letters. Yeah. It is just all <laughs> over the place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then, um, but, there was, but there was apparently a lettering stencil that they had, but hmm. the guys used it by just slapping the paint in one direction over it. And if they didn't use the stencil, you'd go in and you would touch up with black around your letters and try to clean them up. And that's when you get a lot of those weird variants. On the Nevada County narrow gauge, if you look at the life of Nevada County number nine, 
the nine changes shape because somebody's it got painted nice once, and then from then on somebody was retouching it, and so that's the same thing you see in West Side. Yeah, not standardized. It's not perfect. But that's the vibe we kind of want to get, so I'll see what I can do with it. We'll be seeing more of the Shea. You know, we're showing mm-hmm. where it is currently. We wanted to show, again, the full pipeline of what you're seeing outside of just our Unreal Engine featurettes and all of the hard work and, you know, amazing talent and personalities that are going into making these things. And so this is the Shea and its constituent components as they are, and we hope that this will be a fun little showcase that will then be fully paid off once you're able to hear the six beats and a nice logging three chime on Ponderosa. And so please stay tuned for that. We will finish this up very shortly. Now we want to give you guys the chance to ask some questions to our research team, which uh, we put up a Q&A on Patreon and we have selected some of your questions from there. And so let's dive right in. First question is from Kyle Pennypacker. And Kyle asks, what has been the hardest aspect of locomotive design to research? One might assume the paint and lettering styles would be the most challenging, but it might be something more mechanically related, like dimensions of smaller components. Conversely, what has been the easiest? I think this is a really interesting question, especially with the examples given, because, yeah, you might think that the paint and lettering styles would be the most challenging. And first off, like West Side, they can be, right? Eric just went into how West Side lettering is really difficult to replicate. But in terms of finding what's going on, we have a very unique opportunity to play to our strengths with lettering and painting because we can use catalog paint styles which are very well documented for the most part. And we can use road paint styles as we have them. And if we genuinely can't replicate a road's paint style, we don't have to. An engine needs, you know, appliances, right? It, if it says if it says water pump, you've got to have a water pump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like paint especially is something that you can see directly in photographs. And the other benefit of it is it's all on the outside, right? Well, most of it. But in, in the case of things that would be maybe a bit trickier is things that are hidden away that you don't often see in photographs or might be left out or implied in diagrams, especially if you're unable to find an interior photo of something like a cab or a car interior, then a lot of it is going to come down to knowing the general practice for that builder or Mm -hmm. having all of the requisite diagrams for individual components and having enough experience with that era of knowing where they all go. Exactly. You know, a, a microcosm of this, to use an example, that's that's very close to me. One of the projects that our modelers are currently working on calls out a Wisconsin Central style gauge glass. This is one thing that absolutely stumped me. I don't know what a Wisconsin Central style gauge glass is. Uh, I know that VNT25 had one when it was new. I asked our shop crew and they don't know where the current gauge glass on VNT25 came from. As far as I know, it's a Southern Pacific standard design. It was probably put on at the shops and sparks at some point, but it's the closest thing we have. And genuinely, if you know what a Wisconsin Central style gauge glass is, let us know because we can use that information. Interior components like that, trying to get those right, is seriously challenging. And similarly, we can play to our strengths after a fashion. If we genuinely don't know and can't find the information and no one we can communicate with can find the information, we can fall back on general practice and get something that would work. But as much as possible, we don't want to do that because especially the better we do our jobs overall, the more people are going to take us as a resource. And if we make a mistake, especially on something obscure, then we're affected the world of preservation around us. Um, We don't want to do that for the worse. We only want to do that for the better. The other thing that's uh, difficult is how the locomotive appears with all the different appliances. And a lot of these locomotives had a long life in different owners. Different parts could end up in different places, like you mentioned earlier with the the chaise. Yeah. You know, I I did talk just earlier about how frequently these chaise changed. When you're a modeler, you put together all the sources available to you, you represent them as best you can, and when you've run out of energy, essentially, you go, that's what we have. But when you're a researcher, you're pulling up 
all of the variants that there are. And yeah. with something that changed as much as these Shays did, people like Theo or Andrew have an endless task. There's not really one definitive, oh, this is how it was. Some, yeah. you know, some of that comes from safety acts and, and regulations. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are cases where you'll find engines uh, modified to fit a specific application, right? Like the pipings on this side are set this way because they operated a certain specific way. I, I personally love the why. Yeah, actually, I talk about 25's gauge glass. It has two now. It didn't have two now last year. That's a new thing. And it's very exciting operationally. But the cab of that locomotive will never look the same. And our next question is from Steven, who says, Complete font sets can be amazing to find, but I know that isn't always the case, especially when dealing with time periods where most of the work was done by eyeballing it. How much of the typography included was original sets? And most importantly, how much did you have to create from scratch based on other letters and reference photos? What would you do in the case of, say, a partial font that you need to fill in the rest of the letters for? You recreate the characters that you have references for first. And through that, you hope for the best in that you're going to be able to learn what the style is. And then you just kind of go from there. It's really kind of a leap of faith for a lot of it. Um, I've definitely had to go back and fix a lot of stuff because it just doesn't line up with what the overall vibe of the whole font is. Um, and so it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, sometimes you have to scrap a significant amount of work, but you just kind of got to do it. Recreating stuff from very little is a fascinating job, but it, it does require a lot of rework. Um, even when railroads provided an actual lettering diagram and we have the lettering diagram in our hands, it only had the exact characters that were needed for that car. So there there are a few cases where we do have a full alphabet. For example, when Pullman would prepare lettering diagrams for cars that were ordered, whether freight or passenger cars, specifically passenger cars, passenger cars often had names. And so the Pullman lettering diagrams that we have actually have full alphabets with them so that when they're, you know, when they're painting the names of passenger cars, um, they can have any letter already standardized, ready to go. But that's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, so, and I'll, and I'll also note need... that's only some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. And even when we do have the lettering diagrams, sometimes they're not entirely accurate, just like they were talking earlier about um, uh, folios and, and diagrams not being like 100% correct to how the mm-hmm. thing is actually made. Andrew and I photographed a lot of uh, lettering diagrams at the Denver Public Library. And as I was comparing them, I realized the lettering diagrams that the Denver and Rio Grande prepared. Uh, were not actually supposed to tell you how to paint the letter. It was only supposed to show you how big to paint the letter and where to put it on the car. Yeah. So they're, they're pretty mm-hmm. useless for our our purposes, converting them into a digital font. One thing that I'll I'll bring up to compliment uh, Josh talking about the Pullman diagrams. So for anyone curious, those are in the um, the Carly Newberry Library, and if you if you look that up, you can find them. They're all free to get online, at least, you know, the ones that we use from that library. Others are proprietary. You can see the name ones include a full alphabet. The road name ones do not. And the road name ones are often a different typeface. The things that Pullman produced for their own use do not include a full library, which is interesting to me. I guess to a degree, they could guarantee that they weren't going to need the other letters, and they couldn't guarantee that another railroad wasn't going to ask for a car with a Buckwild name. The other source that we look at a lot, um, and, and I bring these up with a lot of the guys are uh, sign painting books and, and guides on lettering, striping, and how all that works. And so that was a different trade back then. You were professionally a sign painter. You did this lettering. So you had a whole series of learning and all of these resources that you took along which included general Romans and general block, general Egyptian lettering styles, which Mm -hmm. kind of like are the root of the variants that a railroad might use or a locomotive might use. So when we're missing specific characters, you can kind of fall back on those, as as the others have mentioned, and using them as a guide. Yeah, Um, and and especially... Lettering had a book 
that you can find on, I think, archive.org from like 1911 or something. And it talks all about how to do certain typefaces and how to do gold leaf and things like that. Comb through other resources, right? If your particular road doesn't have something, look for something close enough. Part of why a lot of people use the B&O Roman from the B&O Historical Society, which is included in our game, it's one of the few fonts that we didn't produce in-house, is because um, the B&O Freight Roman is generally just a beautiful, beautiful, well-crafted Eastern Roman. If you want something that plays that part well, you can't do much better without making your own, which we are also doing. Next question is from Colonel Cactus. Information on Baldwin is relatively well-kept and easy to find. How do you find information on more obscure builders like Brooks? It's exactly the same process as Baldwin. Uh, I start with Pacific NG because Andrew's done a lot of that work already. But, you know, genuinely, Pacific NG will have reference photos of every narrow gauge Brooks preserved in the West. It'll have references to catalogs that are available online. Um, I know that this question asker in particular is aware of some of those, but, you know, that gives you by and large what is available. You can also look at period trade journals and find references to specific classes that were out there. Um, you can find references from the Alco days. And in some cases, if you know where to look, you can find primary sources that are not online at all. But that's a very different skill set. And it's a different skill set than I have, right? Andrew can do that. I can't because I grew up in the age of, of digital research. I think I can speak for Josh and I that we both like to go through things in archives. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like old paper. And, and yeah. one of the things, and I tell this, I had a little motto that I... I had written down earlier that um, if you're really interested in this stuff, go everywhere and talk to everyone, be it whoever's at a museum archive that might have some connection to a, a locomotive builder or a car builder, because a lot of the info that we have to fall back on and, and others in railroading and uh, hobbyists hasn't been checked in a long time. Somebody hasn't mm -hmm. gone and actually gone to the library or the archive and said, hey, do you have this stuff? It's taken off of notes that happened 30, 40 years ago. And yeah, there might and, be stuff out there that no one's found. Yeah, and, and you get this massive game of telephone. A couple of things, you know, other more obscure builders. We know that Porter has an archive that's preserved in Canada that we've been in contact with. Um, Mason has archives around we are lucky enough to have um, have had digitized some uh, original Mason diagrams and or reproductions of original Mason diagrams. Huge shout outs to everyone who digitizes stuff because it makes it so much more accessible to people that aren't willing or able to travel everywhere. But I will second Andrew saying go everywhere if you can, because frequently what you'll do is for the local people here, you'll light a fire under us, right? We actually have a thing that we encourage docents at the Nevada State Railroad Museum to do, which is if someone asks a question that you not only don't know, but can't find the answer to while you're on shift, get their email and find the answer later and email them back because then you'll know that for the next person who asks and then you'll have uncovered that information and that's how this stuff stays in the public consciousness otherwise it just isn't there our next question from drew barker considering how many libraries repositories and museums are around the country my question is this um, aside from already scanned documents, how often has any of the research team had to scan or photograph actual paper drawings, ledgers, photos, etc.? And there is a lot of undiscovered information out there. Thank you for your time and hard work. So, uh, microfiche is a uh, recording method of dinosaurs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, it's like microfilm. So so sometimes you run into uh, aperture cards, which are kind of like a microfiche in a, in a heavy card. <clears throat> Um, I've, I've photographed and scanned a couple of those at the California State Library before. Yeah, well, so to answer this question, though, um, on during the National Narrow Gauge Convention, which we announced the game, Andrew and I actually spent an entire day at the Denver Public Library um, photographing drawings and lettering diagrams that they have there in their collection. Um, 
So we have done a considerable amount of in-archive work, thumbing through the paper, um, viewing these documents, and uh, digitizing them as best as we can. Um, I've also done work at the uh, University of Wyoming, which shockingly has a lot of narrow-gauge uh, information from around the country. It's weird that it wound up in Laramie, but that's where it is. And also Colorado Railroad Museum, obviously, University of Wyoming. Um, we could go on and on and on with a list of, of archives that Andrew and I and other our other researchers have visited and and copied materials from their archives. I, I think, yeah, between that and, and a lot of field research, um, I travel quite a bit and document structures, uh, pieces of railroad equipment while I'm out and about. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to work with a lot of folks like uh, Herman Dar, uh, Kyle Wyatt, other people from uh, the railroad preservation world or people that have manufactured drawings for model building purposes and have uh, been able to work with them on getting access to data. So it's it's not only just institutions, but it's working with people on a personal level. Um, but I say that uh, quite a, about five of us tend to go out and, and do physical research in some way or, you know, take photographs and measurements and track things down. It's a love of trying to find that data. Um, but as was mentioned before, there's a lot of things out there that just haven't been noted. You know, it, it never hurts to go look. Mm -hmm. and it's never too late to be the next person who finds something new or finds something that wasn't known before. And having boots on the ground and, you know, eyes in the books looking for something is how all of this stuff comes up. That is research. Yeah. It's just being curious and looking and asking questions. I also, I also just have to laugh that um, it's difficult to quantify the amount of times the research team has had to scan things because I've had multiple times, some of them during the time this project has been in development, when I have found something that has been recently digitized and realized it was one of us that digitized it. The PDF is coming from inside the house. Yeah, but no, you know, sometimes folks like Andrew Joss will, will go into archives and take photos of things. I generally won't, but I will contact people who work in archives and ask them for their notes. And now our last question of the night from Tommaso Savoldi. Hi, Studio 346. I'm a history student from Italy, and I'm really excited about this devlog. I'm graduating in American history, and I'm in love with 19th century American steam, so I wanted to ask some questions regarding primary sources. Is there some kind of institution, foundation, museum, etc., that has most of the sources you found, or are these scattered in many places? Also, how many of these sources are digitized? Living on another continent, that would help me a lot. Anyway, I'm eager to get my hands on this game, and I love the dedication the team is putting into this project. Cheers from Italy. This is the last one. Who wants to take it? Uh, this is a hard question, and I don't want to read a long list. As we were preparing for this devlog, um, figuring out answers for the questions, um, I wrote down like four or five places that are good online sources. And then everyone else started adding more, and so we have like several dozen now. In the last five years, a lot of institutions have really opened up their archives, and especially with um, how copyright and public domain laws are changing, creating basically open access archives, anything that's out of copyright, they just put online now. California State Archives, like a lot of the California institutions, have started putting their stuff on their own website, and then they back it up onto archive.org. Denver Public Library has had a very good online repository for many years, the Library of Congress as well, um, and a lot of these smaller organizations are starting to get on that as well. I mentioned when I introduced myself that I'm president of the Western Crossroads Railroad Museum. Uh, we don't have a lot of narrow gauge specific material, but that organization was founded specifically because a lot of private collections went up onto the auction market all at once. And we're like, we can't let this disappear into a basement again. Um, so we got some donors and were able to acquire these collections and scan them and put them on archive.org, um, which apparently has helped a lot of people. It was a very proud moment when our, our, our collections were cited for the first time in a magazine article. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide a list uh, somewhere for the people that are interested in looking up these organizations organizations that, that we get these materials from. A lot of uh, state organizations, uh, like the ones you meant, like, well, Denver Public Library, uh, California State Archive, and California State Library, 
there's no charge to go in and do research. You just have to go in, and in a lot of cases, you're allowed to take a camera and photograph. So even if it hasn't been digitized and put online yet, if you're nearby, it's pretty easy to get in, get into this stuff. Sometimes, too, it, it's all about who you know. <laughs> um, the, sometimes things are in private archives, and um, we, if we if we know or private collections, and um, if we know them, we can ask them. Be like, hey, do you have this? And they're like, yeah, sure. And they'll let us copy it. Um, and other times, like even if we can't make it to a museum, we'll reach out to a friend or somebody that we know that is local to that museum, and they can go do the work. They can uh, scan it or photograph it for us. So there is a lot of networking involved with this kind of research as well. Networking is huge, right? E yeah. Even if it's free to go see something, you can't go see it if you don't know it exists. Alrighty, and that's the last of our Q&A. Um, to everyone on our research team, thank you so much for uh, giving your time tonight and sharing all of your knowledge. And I, I know this has gone a bit long, and we, we might do a bit of trimming just to package it for uh, the Patreon and YouTube, but Thanks again so much for this, and to everyone watching. Blooper uh, reel at the end. Blooper reel at the end. De definitely blooper, blooper reel, reel at the yeah. end. Devlog, we put eight nerds in a live stream chat. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> three hours. Aside from the already, oh, let me try that again without knocking my pills over. You gotta live a little and go touch the old paper. <laughs> I am mortified to hit stop recording and then find out I get zip bombed by this file. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Josh, you do it. <laughs> I, I, I know it's I know it's late. We all want to go home, but it's, it's the yeah. last one. We got this. Finish line is there. Sorry, um, I, I need to take a quick pause here. Someone, for some reason, is setting off like five billion fireworks outside my apartment. So I'm yeah, we we certainly can hear. You don't have to have a fireworks shop down the road, do you? <laughs> if we did, it's not there anymore. <laughs> oh, I, I figured out why they're lighting off fireworks. It's goat cheese day. Oh, oh yeah. I was going to ask, did Rico make the cheese? But I don't want to think about that. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> now, see, the real question is, when do we have the actual WTYP cast come on for one of these? And just let them oh, team the entire podcast. That would be entertaining. Jesus Christ, are they still going off? I, I've I literally been look. sitting here playing, playing like Bloons Tower Defense. And to Tom and Jake, we're sorry. Say the line, Bart. Everyone shut up, okay? For uh, Nerdy's Reasters. Uh, I flood that. I That's think okay. I've said about half a dozen words in the past <laughs> three hours. The explosions outside of my apartment have stopped. And then you both have to deal with the consequences of our actions. We very greatly await Mark's return so that I never have to do this again. <laughs> oh, I, I... Jake, do you want to say the line? No, I don't. No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I, 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 I was...